the theme of this uh, session is how is this new generation of philanthropists or philanthropic capitalists um, reinventing philanthropy? Um, how can they use insights from business to improve the effectiveness of their giving? Are there some aspects of philanthropy that should be off limits to business thinking? And how can philanthropy capitalists harness the profit motive to bring about social change. Philanthropic capitalism is about a group of highly successful, super rich entrepreneurs who are applying both their wealth and their talents to solving the world's biggest problems. Mo Ibrahim, who is a Sudanese telecoms engineer um, who trained in Britain, uh, got into mobile phones quite early on and then set up a company called Celtel that brought the mobile phone to Africa um, and did amazing things and has probably contributed more to Africa's development than much official development aid. Now, Murray Broom sold his company and tried to work out what he was going to do with his philanthropy. And what he learned from his business was that political leadership was the key issue for Africa. Where there was good political leadership, there was a good business environment for his company, and those countries were then making progress on the Millennium Development Goals. So he took this insight and set up something called the Mo Ibrahim Foundation, which offers what he calls the biggest prize in the world, which is an annual prize awarded to a retired African leader who has done most for his people. And the first award was made last year to Joachim Gisano of Mozambique, which is a country that has made some incredible progress. Now, the prize in part is there to reward and incentivize leaders, but that's not really the main issue. The prize is also there to create a debate globally and in Africa about leadership. What you've described is a series of kind of heroic entrepreneurs who made their fortune in a very short period of time through the new technologies, the new, uh, the new economy, and then, having been so successful at that, decided to apply their talents and their resources in a heroic style of philanthropy rather than a more institutional one. Um, and then, of course, we see some of that beginning to transition. And George Soros is a classic example who started out in the kind of heroic style but then decided the only way to really accomplish his goals was to build institutions, uh, which he has done. And now he's even come to the conclusion that he's not going to spend all of his resources while living. And, in fact, he wants to leave behind an institution. So there's been a real shift in his own thinking. And I suspect that may happen with some of the other philanthro capitalists as well. The total foundation giving in the United States was just under $43 billion. And an additional $229 billion of individual giving by Americans to their own causes, most of which go to hospitals and universities and, and things like that. So $43 billion in, in foundation giving. Now that compares, obviously, to the U.S. federal budget in 2007 of just under $3 trillion and the GDP of the United States, which was around $13 trillion. So all of foundation giving is a tiny, tiny little chunk of money compared to the two really big drivers of, of society the public and the private sector. So if we're really going to have an impact, we have to use that $43 billion or whatever amount it gets up to in a way that is highly leveraged and highly strategic. We have to be the kind of tugboats that push these bigger vessels into the right harbors uh, toward the right goals. Because we deal with children, all of our success is derived from families and children. Our strategic thinking and giving is always going to be where there is dire need for children, whether it's in children's hospitals, whether it's um, working with um, World Vision in the distribution of product around the world to orphanages or in crisis zones. So net, 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 we're trying to create one global safety standard for all children for the entire world. And I'm working with Guy and um, the ICC uh, hopefully down the road to be our convener of governments. But before we can convene government, we have to get all of the other stakeholders into the tent. Because if the other stakeholders aren't in the tent and there's one outlier, it's nothing but aggravation. And once we create the code and we get all of the countries to agree, we then go um, to get the governments to basically put their sale of approval on it. Ted Turner actually changed the way the UN does business. Uh, uh, indeed, when he approached us, uh, Kofi Annan, uh, when he heard the figure of one billion, he had to ask three times, you mean one million or one billion? 
we couldn't believe that it would be a billion dollars that he would be willing to give. And absolutely correct, we, we didn't have a mechanism. In fact, the UN is not allowed to take technically funds from the private sector, from, in fact, from non-state actors for core programs of the United Nations. So the only way we could do and use his funds was for supplementary programs. When, when, when he did arrive on the scene, there was a lot of questioning saying, uh, what does Ted Turner want? Uh, what's the end result, etc." Well, the facts speak for themselves. He's come and he's committed and he's given his uh, monies. To date, he has given about $670 million. It's come through our office uh, and with zero expectation of return. Return as in, uh, what, can I, what can the UN do for me type of thing? But the bigger, bigger change, which is often the untold story, is there are others who've come forward and said, why can't I, why can't I be engaged? If Ted can do it, so can I. I'm also committed to the same issues, same social and economic issues. It's a problem of culture, you know, because in France, we can raise a tax. It's, it's easy. And when I, uh, I speak about that with the American administration, for example, I don't give the name, but uh, somebody say, oh, Philippe, you are communist, you know? Me? No. <laughs> yes, why? Uh, you say that, and you say that, I say that because in France it's very easy, when you have a problem, you raise the tax, you, you, you increase the tax. People need to be paid more. We are not getting the best talent in the world into solving the problems of the world because people cannot afford, who are really talented, to work for these institutions unless they have their own money. And this is really a ridiculous situation because by paying the leadership of these organizations a little bit more, you'll attract much better talent and that will enable these organizations not only to be more effective but to raise more money and to do more with less money. So it's a very backward situation. I think that the global agencies are one of our only hopes to uh, take the large leap uh, into uh, our international problems, and they should be at the forefront. Why recreate all these structures left and right? It's not efficient, and that we should give them, we should empower them. The challenge, and I think many of the panelists and some of the others in the room have, have pointed to this, the challenge is that there is no rational economy for this very important sector. There is a more or less maybe we can't say that anymore, rational economy for the private sector, which is, which is through profits. And there is a more or less rational economy for the public sector, which is through taxation. But the, the economy for the nonprofit sector is whimsical because donors can change their mind on a dime. And I think this is a real risk. Um, and, and we risk losing something that is vitally important if we can't figure out a way to provide some stability, if we can't hire the right people and provide the incentives for them to perform at their highest level and give enough general operating support so they can do all the things they need to do, not just conduct a series of individual projects and have no money to raise money or no money to communicate, no money to build their own constituencies. So I think this is a, this is a, a theme that runs through a lot of the comments, that this is a vitally important sector. It is very diverse. Its diversity is one of the great strengths. We need to improve its performance, but we need to do that in a way that doesn't squeeze out what is distinctive about the role of the nonprofit sector in being a balance between what is purely public and what is purely private.